Hello and welcome to the Armenian News Network, Grung. I'm Aspet Pedrosian. Before we begin, I'd like to thank you for listening and supporting our podcast. If you like what you hear, we'd appreciate your help in reaching a wider audience by subscribing to our channel, liking and sharing our podcasts. We are available on most major media platforms, including YouTube, Apple and Google Podcasts, Spotify, and more. In this conversation on Grung, we'll be talking about the role of humanities and social sciences in Armenian life. Our host for this discussion is Dr. Asped Kochigian, who is a senior lecturer of political science and international relations at Bentley University in Massachusetts. This episode was recorded on Thursday, December 3rd, 2020. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. I'm Aspet Kochikian. One of the topics we're going to be talking about is about academia and academic work, especially in the fields of humanities and social sciences. Both fields, or academic work in both of these fields, have been instrumentalized by various ideologies or political regimes. Moreover, various disciplines and subdisciplines within each one of these fields, such as anthropology, art history, political science, history, literature, etc., have a long tradition of being the middle children of academia and are rarely considered to have a role in shaping minds and trends in society. In Armenia, the roles of humanities and social sciences have undergone changes since Soviet and immediate post-Soviet times. At a time where both these fields were viewed as instruments of legitimization of communism and later nationalism, academics in these fields had to navigate the murky waters of ideology unless they were willing to be labeled pseudo-academics or sometimes even traitors. The challenge of having robust disciplines in humanities and social sciences in Armenia is manifold. These include encouraging critical thinking, void of ideology, the role of individuals with degrees in humanities and social sciences in the larger society, and challenging pre-existing paradigms and much, much more. Today, joining me in this conversation is Dr. Angela Haruchunyan, who is an associate professor of art history and the chair of the Department of Fine Arts and Art History at the American University of Beirut. She is a founding member of BICAR, Beirut Institute for Critical Analysis and Research, and the Johannesian Research Institute in the Humanities in Yerevan, Armenia. She is the editor of Art Margins, peer-reviewed journal from MIT Press. Her monograph, The Political Aesthetics of the Armenian Avant-Garde, the Journey of Painterly Real was published by Manchester University Press in 2017 and then again in 2019. Welcome, Angela. Thank you, Asked, for inviting me to this conversation. Looking forward. So, Angela, you're in humanities, within the field of art history, within humanities. I'm in social sciences. So two topics, two fields that, as I mentioned in my introduction, have major, major challenges. I can argue and I can go on about the importance of social sciences beyond academia, as you can do uh, in art history. I would like to hear your opinion as to how do you justify the role of humanities in the world today beyond academia? Actually, first of all, I want to thank you for uh, agreeing not to speak about the immediate political events in Armenia and the <laughs> ongoing um, social and political crisis. Um, mm -hmm. and to engage in a conversation that perhaps requires a different temporality, different engagement uh, with the critical role of the humanities in Armenia and beyond uh, the country's borders. Um, coming back to your question, I think it's already not worth it that we are asked to justify right, the humanities. Right. So <laughs> we need to ask uh, in our specific historical conditions, why is it that humanities require justification? What are the modes of justification? Um, because justifications are normally, especially now, are made according to a specific regime of emergency, which is the regime, I could argue, of right. neoliberal economic governmentality, that we're in a constant crisis and we have to justify any form of knowledge that is not easily instrumentalized for expedient needs. Or popularized, maybe even, no, Angela? Yes, absolutely. Either justified as instruments for urgent, expedient and practical needs, uh, or, yes, as, or commodified, right, mm -hmm. as, right. as, as form of, forms of entertainment, in a way. Right. So, in a sense, like, justifications are normally brought up for the humanities in contemporary, what I call, like, neoliberal academia that operates with the managerial logic and the logic of marketing, is that Humanities need to be subservient to other disciplines, such as you offer philosophy, but not philosophy as, a, as an autonomous discipline, as a mode of pursuing truth with its mm -hmm. own historicity and so on. But let's say ethics for engineers, so they construct bridges upon on which people 
to not fall or collapse and so on. Or right. uh, art history is instrumentalized and packaged for doctors who are being trained to exercise empathy towards their patients. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, have, I have actually like a short anecdote. Uh, after the Beirut explosion of August 4th, one of my friends was uh, badly hurt and she, she needed both medical help and psychological help. And so I called a, a colleague of mine who immediately came. She's a psychiatrist. She spoke to her and then uh, after, after her conversation with, uh, with my friend, her patient, I looked at her and was like, if you ever need an art historian in an emergency <laughs> situation, please let me know. <laughs> well, this reminds me of the joke that when something happens, they say, is there a doctor here? And like, yeah, I'm a doctor. I'm a doctor of philosophy. And like, no, you're useless. We, really, we need a real doctor. <laughs> doctor, doctor. <laughs> doctor, doctor. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Um, but uh, Angela, uh, before you go on, I mean, this is true also in hard sciences, right? For instance, you did mention about engineers, but it seems that, for instance, math or physics or any other hard science field is also instrumentalized in, in some cases. Engineers do rely on math uh, more often than not. Yes, they do have math or physics or chemistry have their own sort of path in and by themselves, mm -hmm. but they, to some extent, it seems that all disciplines are uh, one way or another instrumentalized. Yes, absolutely. But it also means, uh, it also matters, right, how this instrumentalization takes place. I guess both hard sciences and the humanities, surprisingly, the humanities and hard sciences, as different as they are in terms of their research tools, methodologies, but they also have something in common. They are grounded upon an understanding that these disciplines are autonomous through their own, you know, laws, objects mm -hmm. of study, but also they both deal both with the, with the empirical and conceptual worlds. So within the logic of capitalist commodification that is geared towards the expansion of this logic to subsume spheres that have been hitherto uh, semi-autonomous, mm -hmm. even hard sciences, even the humanities claims to autonomy cannot be easily accepted. I look at this process as, a, as part and parcel of the ongoing kind of neoliberalization of academias that began perhaps in the 80s mm -hmm. and culminated in the, uh, in, the, in the 2000s. But of course, hard sciences are especially um, porous, right, towards instrumentalization mm -hmm. because they, are close, they, they need more funding from right. industry or from the state and so on, and hence they are more um, adept to, let's say, ideological instrumentalization than the humanities. But that has been a trend, I mean, in terms of the instrumentalization of humanities and to some extent, uh, social sciences. I mean, one of the earliest fields of humanities probably would be history, right? In terms of, and then eventually mm -hmm. art history and, and so on and so forth. You know, it used to be a field that was uh, used by people to actually justify them going, getting a college degree. Uh, you know, and it used to be also gendered as well. You know, art history used to be, to a large extent, you know, a female dominated field and men wouldn't uh, go into art history as much as women in terms of quantity, although the empirical evidence in terms of looking at outcomes or in terms of production, uh, you would see there are, there used to be more men uh, in art history who would produce books. Obviously, this is another issue in terms of gendering, but mm -hmm. it has been a, it, it has been an ongoing process, right? Even before the neoliberalization of everything around us. What would it be the main epochs, if you want to look at it, if you were to divide humanities uh, has mm -hmm. gone through in the last maybe 100 years or so? Very like large, major benchmarks. If we, Yes, if we are talking about uh, independent or semi-autonomous disciplines of the humanities, right? We are talking about a very recent history of maybe maximum 200 years since the 19th century. Uh -huh. And it was only in the late 19th century when, as you mentioned already, uh, history, philosophy, philosophy earlier on, but let's say history, art history, psychology, etc., cultural studies, um, they acquired um, separate independent chairs in, let's say, European universities. Right. But if I'm to kind of periodize, right, I'd like to mm -hmm. uh, periodize from the perspective of our present, when we are again <clears throat> asked to justify the humanities within the instrumentalizing mm -hmm. logic of economic governmentality, I would go and revisit uh, similar moments that we had, though through a different kind of in a different historical conjuncture of uh, what I'd call historical danger. Let's say in the 1930s, when Nazis were encroaching on Europe, right. and there was a sense that the humanists, right, uh -huh. were defending the autonomous pursuit for human, of humanistic scholarship, autonomous pursuit of truth, 
um, as a weapon against the forces of barbarity and darkness. Right. So their understanding was that the humanities with their internal laws of disciplinary composition, constitution, can be political a posteriori. Mm. They do not serve a political commission or an ideological purpose in and of themselves, but they can have political effects uh, in the specific historical conjuncture between, let's say, uh, Nazism and Stalinism. Whereas right. the, around the same time, the Marxian debates around the discipline's relative autonomy, that yes, they are internally autonomous, but ultimately they're grounded within a, a broader social material world and are embedded in it and are political, right? Avant les lettres, as opposed to a posteriori. But today what we have is uh, basically the collapse of these contradictions between the subsumption, political subsumption of the disciplines and their relative autonomy and what we have, uh, what I call a kind of a vulgar instrumentalization without mm. either the nuances of the politics of humanist thinkers or the dialectical thought of the good old Marxists. Right. So this is one period. The second I would mention the, the 1960s when you had a sort of a crisis of authority and crisis of disciplines especially in European acad academia, in France, right, in Italy, the right. student revolts. Revolts, uh, yeah. And the, the, the questioning of the master discourse, right, the university discourse, the master discourse. In this situation, again, the, the same debates, I would say, not, not the same debates, but the same polarities in the 30s that we have between the Marxists and the humanists are revived. Is knowledge in and of itself political or is it through the slow temporality of critical historical humanistic work that... The scholarship, this work, can have unforeseen political effects. Right. But that, that unforeseenness is what makes it quite uh, pro problematic, isn't it? You know, in terms of mm -hmm. when you talk about uh, fascist Nazi uh, ideology at the same time, emerging at the same time as communism and the manifestation of that in the form of socialist realism, be that in terms of architecture, art, and so on and so forth. You know, you would see that in it by itself, that is political. It is, it does end up being in different manifestations of it. It becomes subservient of the ideology, regardless of the polarity. I mean, one would think that when it comes to communism versus, you know, Nazism as two mm -hmm. um, opposing ideologies, yet they use the same concept in terms of uh, socialist realism or manifestations of that in their uh, narrative or creating a narrative or justification for the political rule or the political regime? Um, I'll have to disagree with you because uh, mm -hmm. for me, socialist realism, both aesthetically, politically and philosophically, is completely opposite to Nazi aesthetics or Nazi philosophy. One is, let's say, the basis of uh, its, its historical philosophical justification it's looking progressively towards the future. I'm not talking about reality, but the ideological justification, right? By right. appropriating the, the tradition of the past, that what they saw as a sort of a higher historical plane of, of enlightenment and of emancipation mm -hmm. of humanity. Whereas the other is a narrow, non-universalist, racialist mm. um, ideology. But I, I think we, we, we also more or less you know, operate still within the, within the shadow of the Cold War polarization, wherein you know, from, the, from the perspective of, let's say, liberal discourse and liberal thought, there is an identification of totalistic intellectual method, philosophical method with totalitarian ideology wherein Nazism and Stalinism are equated. This right. is a construct of liberalism mm -hmm. itself, which is a Cold War construct. Right, right. And within that context, Angela, for instance, mm -hmm. if we were to look at it, I mean, the, the Nazi experiment, you know, lasted for roughly about 10, 15 years. And let's say even 30 years in the case of Italy, if we were to consider fascism. But in the Soviet Union, the case of the Soviet Union lasted, obviously, the, the communist experiment there lasted for uh, almost a century, let's say seven decades. Mm -hmm. But it was clearly, you had distinctions. You know, you had early Soviet, you had the Stalin period, you had the immediate Stalin thaw, you know, with the de-Stalinization, mm -hmm. and then uh, towards the end, the late Stalin period. So I know from social sciences, in terms of when I were when I would study and uh, look at uh, you know textual analysis, you know obviously Marxism as an ideology was ever present in all aspects of humanities and social sciences. Everything had to be mm -hmm. explained like that, even history. What were the key moments, if you were to look at it, or the key distinctions that you would look at? in Soviet experience of instrumentalizing or utilizing humanities 
throughout the seven decades? I think it's very crucial. It's a very good question you're asking, and it already uh, implies a sort of nuanced understanding of the Soviet world, the Soviet historical right. experience, which means that you know it's counter to the, the dominant uh, ideology today that the Soviet Union or the Soviet ideology was this monolithic entity. Exactly. So it's very crucial to insist on difference within and on periodization of the Soviet experience. In my understanding, you have the immediate post-revolutionary decade, right? Especially the right. 20s, after the, the October Revolution and the Civil War, when the heat the temporality, the expedient temporality of the revolution was giving way to the slower assimilation of the revolutionary experience. Uh, you had a cultural policy draft within the context of the new economic policy, that Lenin introduced, right, which allowed elements of bourgeois mode of economy to coexist within the newly developing socialist production. And mm -hmm. this also invite, implied inviting so-called fellow travelers throughout the 20s mm -hmm. to, to join the construction of the new social world. They didn't need to be Bolsheviks. It's the universal, universalism in a way. Yes, absolutely. And also it's a very specific view of tradition, right, that, mm -hmm. that is implied here. So, so especially in Armenia, right, if we look in Armenia throughout the 20s, you have those thinker scholars who came, who after studying in European universities or spending time in Russia, Acharyan, Tamanyan, Ashatov Anisyan, uh, Manu Kaberian, you can, you can name uh, a lot of them. They came and they became the backbone or the armature of institutionalizing the humanities uh, in Soviet Armenia. But also throughout the 20s, right. the question was largely how to deal with tradition, right? What do we do with the bourgeois tradition of humanistic heritage uh, if we had a political and social revolution? Do we throw bourgeois tradition and culture that baby with the, the bathwater, <clears throat> or do we have right. something to assimilate and incorporate? And Lenin's as answer is that the bourgeois tradition also has a universalizing component, an element that needs to be assimilated, reincorporated within the newly developing intellectual climate or culture of a historically new sort of formation that they saw was emerging. The analogy that comes to my mind is the uh, cultural revolution in China in the late 60s and in the 70s. What you're talking about is maybe more about a compassionate cultural revolution that uh, Lenin was, uh, or selective cultural revolution, where the past is not completely foregone, uh, rather some elements of it are incorporated. Is that a good analogy? No. <laughs> yes and no. Okay. Uh, why I wouldn't call it a cultural revolution? Because uh, in, within the Soviet context, cultural revolution was launched by Stalin in the post-Leninist period, right? With the right. industrialization, the five-year plans, and so on. But Lenin's understanding was that culture is a move much slower than the temporality of uh, political transformation, social temp transformation. You cannot revolutionize culture from above. Okay. You can, of course, you can institute uh, certain policies, you can work with, let's say, fellow travelers, you can work with the avant-gardists, but at the mm -hmm. same time, culture is not something that is subjected to the same temporality than a revolution is. So with Stalin, what we have is an institutionalization of the so-called socialist proletarian culture in the beginning, from above, with the sp same speed and temporality as you would, let's say, transform or reconstruct economy. <laughs> okay. And what it means is like erasing, right? E erasing yeah. all possible seeming contradictions of everyday customs, everyday lives, ethnic uh, and national discourses and so on, and subsuming everything under a, a kind of a, a, the schemata of what was seen in the beginning as a proletarian culture. Of course, in the 30s, uh, you have a backlash against the so-called cultural revolution by Stalinism as well, that constituted itself by reliance not already on the revolutionary temporality of, let's say, economic transformation, or not on the basis of proletarian culture, but on re-energizing the traditionalist discourses that Lenin allowed to flourish in the 20s, but in its Stalinized, in their Stalinized variant. And this is in the 30s especially that I'd like to propose the second periodization, uh, which marks the Stalinization of the humanities mm -hmm. uh, and art as well. <laughs> right. This is the time when um, the Politburo, Stalin personally intervened in the debates of historians he wrote actually some parts of the very prominent uh, textbook of the Bolshevik Party, published right. in 1938, the short course, the history of the Bolshevik Party. 
and he even which was also the, translated into English, and I think I have an, uh, a copy of it in my library from 1938 or 39. Yeah, and I don't know how many millions of copies it was, uh, and dozens of editions it, it saw before this Stalinization. Right. Yeah, and then, like, if I'm kind of proposing a schematic, schematic periodization, we have the relative uh, liberalization of intellectual thought during the thaw, uh, the Khrushchevian thaw. Um, wherein philosophically there was an attempt to revive uh, and revisit the legacy of the 1920s. And we, we are encountering here a partial destalinization um, of philosophical thought as well as history, literature, aesthetics and so on. But I would also argue that in its essential outlines, the Soviet humanities um, is largely the heir of the Stalin era scholarship. Um, which is grounded on the assumption right. that the class contradictions have been abolished. <laughs> Nation becomes uh, uh -huh, as the key exactly. category understood in terms of ethnicity. But I'd like to ask you, as but are the social sciences also subjected to a similar kind of periodization within the Soviet context? It's quite which... interesting. Well, I mean, when it comes to social sciences, my experience globally, not just, you know, uh, regionally, it's quite interesting to see not so much as periodization of, of the field itself, but the the rise and fall of new methods or new tools. I, I can I can talk about, for instance, uh, political science, my field. If you were to look at political science in the early 20th century, it was defined by looking at uh, data, but also political philosophy as a subfield of politics mm -hmm. and political science has been, had developed more. But then, for instance, even within that subfield, for instance, comparative politics, which is one of the more interesting fields, in my opinion, in political science, you see that in 1930s, they used to, comparative politics would have been uh, looking at uh, five, six different countries and looking at election results in the previous five, six, seven, ten, fifteen si years cycle, and so on. Uh -huh. And then, you know, for instance, after the after the Second World War, political science became more of an instrument of of developmental studies. But it, it was instrumentalized within the context of the Cold War, especially in the West. How can what developmental policies can we use to actually entice uh, countries to join our side versus the other side? Then. In the late Cold War period, or immediately after the Cold War period, you had political economy emerging, you know, with the end mm -hmm. of history, as you had mentioned earlier, you know, with Fukuyama's sort of approach as the, the end of history and so on, everything was about economy. So you would see that those, uh, those traditions being forgotten, which actually brings me to a question. With each period, do you feel that there are instruments within the field of humanities that has been forgotten and it was a tragedy, quote unquote, uh, to lose those instruments? within the newly redefined field of humanity. I think the big rupture, if I can speak of a big rupture, was the in the 30s with the Stalinization uh, of the humanity mm. scholarship and with the falsification, erasure of the legacy of the 1920s, especially mm. the humanistic scholarship. And right. in Armenia, we have very tragic examples. Uh, recently, with the Ashot Yovanisyan Institute for um, uh, Research in the Humanities, we published um, we published a book by philosopher Misak Khostikian. Nobody knows his name today. Mm. He studied in Germany at the turn of the century. He was originally part of the Chmiadzin Seminary. So right. he was sent to, to Germany as a, through the col collaboration of the Protestant German circles that were similarly interested in the reformation of the Armenian church. So Khostikian, uh, after, stat after coming back from Germany and defending his uh, dissertation there on... Uh, David the Philosopher, who is known in the Armenian historiography as David the Invincible, uh -huh. he ultimately uh, he was ultimately based in Soviet Armenia, though he had problems with the Soviet authorities or with the Soviet system as such. Right. Yet in 1937 he was he was disappeared. Then you know we learned that he was executed, and nobody knows about his legacy. And what was very courageous about Hostikian's work of visiting a, a historical tradition of an Armenian philosophy is that he confronts through a critical historical work from the meticulous analysis of bibliographic sources, philological, philosophical analysis right. of bibliographic sources, he confronts the whole tradition as a myth that created David the Invincible as a fiction, as a figure mm -hmm. of national philosophy, as a weapon <laughs> that could serve as a weapon <clears throat> for right. uh, uh, Armenia's insistence upon its sovereignty and autonomy. And so he confronts already a falsified tradition 
or a tradition that is a fiction, mm -hmm. wherein the figure of a philosopher as, as an invincible philosopher is constituted traditionally mm -hmm. as a fiction in order to serve as a weapon for the national cause. So, well, uh, this I'm, is an example, an example of Angela, yeah. sorry. Yeah, as an, mm -hmm. this is a very good example of how it can change the meaning and redefine, right? It's reappropriated. You create mm -hmm. something using, sort of, for, for instance, communist or Stalinist or Marxist instruments, but then that, that is easily transformed into becoming a nationalist instrument to, to further push forward for, of an ideology. Mm -hmm. Again, we see instrumentalization and as contradictory as they are, you know, nationalism and communism, at least in this context of Soviet Union and within that context, specifically in Armenia, you see that they are uh, most of the nationalist utiliza utilization of nationalism, of art and humanities and social sciences is very much based on the foundation of Stalinist Marxist instrumentalization uh, prior to that. I would say specifically Stalinist, because arguably, right, I mean, Stalinism, uh, um, I consider Stalinism as a bastardization of, of, of Marxism <laughs> that is grounded right. on critical historical thinking, that is not a doxa, but what Stalin does is uh, it schem he schematizes dialectical materialism, appropriating the right. entire legacy of Marx and then Lenin and so on, and applies it as an unquestionable schema or tradition or doxa, right, upon right. as a straight jacket to uh, to, mm -hmm. to historical reality. So you asked me the question about what is lost, right? What is mm -hmm. this rupture? And I think one important aspect that is lost from this scholarship is precisely its, its nuanced approach to the, uh, to the critical and historical understanding of the social and uh, cultural historical world, uh, both right. uh, in terms of tradition and in terms of the present, that is not subject again to um, an a priori, right, politicization. Right. So what we inherit today, what I consider as a kind of a legacy of uh, Stalinist Soviet scholarship, is this acceptance of tradition as doxa, which is not questionable. We assume that mm -hmm. we have tradition and it cannot be questioned. And then in, in turn, knowledge here, knowledge that is contrived, so-called, or taken out of, the, of, of this tradition, is utilized as a weapon, especially in history, philosophy, art history, and on the, on the other hand, we have the opposite pole, which is not as institutionalized or doesn't have the same tradition and legacy as the Soviet <laughs> Stalinist trend that I, right. I've just mentioned, which is mm -hmm. sort of an uncritical and schematic application of uh, post-Marxist Western theory, critical theory, cultural theory upon, uh, upon our own reality. And this is actually, when you talk about this, it's quite fascinating to see the disconnect sometimes existing between the communist and post-communist world and the Western world. And nowhere uh, better, this is becomes more accentuated as much as in the Armenian world, right? Uh, you would yeah. see scholars, humanities, and in, so, in humanities and social sciences from Soviet, post-Soviet, and uh, especially current contemporary Armenia, and you juxtapose that with Armenian scholars in the Western world and their narratives, their, their utilization of both social sciences and humanities, although both of these fields, except for history, uh, were not that prevalent in the diaspora. So now you see two traditions that, other than coming into conflict with each other in the initial years, now we see, especially in recent years, we're seeing there's a synchronization, there's a synergy in perceptions, as you said, in terms of there are facts that are undeniable, unquestionable. They exist and uh, no one questions them. So within that context, what's your view about the, the passage or the transition of humanities in post-Soviet independent Armenia? Have there been any epochs within that? What is the, the trajectory that you see social sciences or and humanities going in Armenia? It's very complex because on the one hand, many things have changed, but on the other hand, uh, things are <laughs> as they were when I was a student right. uh, at the Erevan State University. So on the one hand, right, you have official academic uh, institutions, the university itself, Academy of Sciences with its many institutes and so on where the main ideological trajectory is geared towards nationalism, which acts more or less as a straitjacket for any scholarly inquiry. And uh, I actually just found out that uh, the Academy is developing a new textbook on the history of the Armenian people, and the authors claim that they've radically revisited the flawed and politically dangerous thesis that 
For centuries, Armenian people were deprived of statehood, and they claimed that the Armenian statehood uh, has a history of 5,000 years, right. uh, which was barely ever interrupted, right? So here you have mm -hmm. a kind of a, a fiction that come to replace the traumatic encounter of uh, the interruptions, disintegrations of Armenian political unity and statehood and so on, coming to replace the traumatic en encounter of history with a with a cultural kind of sublation or sublimation with this uh, with this trauma in the form of claiming that we've never had we had five thousand years of history, or um, the Department of Philosophy at YSU mainly studies Garegin Nuzdez, the most significant philosopher. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so on the one hand, we have the established academic institutions, we have the official historiography. But also we have independent centers, critically minded scholars and so on, subject the tradition that they take for granted this very same tradition, right, that the academy, mm -hmm. let's say, advances to radical revisionism. Mm -hmm. Recently, there was a volume published by so Socioscope, a very pioneering and welcoming endeavor um, that examines gender and sexuality in Armenia from the pre-Christian age to the post-Soviet era. And what most of the authors do, they apply a kind of a ready-made Foucauldian theoretical language to varied historical examples uh, without historicizing the constitution of this very same tradition that they are attempting to re deconstruct. Mm. So here, right, tradition is already, always already assumed to be heteronormative, patriarchal and so on. So they, they take the tradition that is given to them by the official discourse for granted without trying to understand what is actually the nature of this tradition. Right. Uh, how can we question So basically it? you're saying, Angela, that the, the, the lexicon is updated, but the, the tools and the, mm -hmm. and the presumptions or the, you know, a priori ideas are not challenged, but they're thinly veiled under, you know, with the academic lexicon that it, it's, it comes across as being modern or contemporary or avant-garde, but in reality, they're not. Yes, I think so. And what they share, right? Like as different right. as these two trends are, and they're very, uh, um, there's an animosity, obvious animosity between the two, is that they both again politicize any engagement with the, with the historical, cultural material before they even begin the scholarly inquiry. Right. right. So for the on so the it's one a, hand, the academic Kool Aid in a way, utilizing all those theories and applying it if it's feasible or not. So it becomes yes. more of a clash of egos rather than discussion or reevaluation of the essence of ideas. Yes, absolutely. I, I, I agree with you. I don't want to sound like I'm I'm complaining about everyone and everything, but mm -hmm. <laughs> I think there is an important work of historical critical scholarship that uh, needs to be done and we have a tradition of it it's a tradition again that has been falsified erased but something that we can recover hmm. for what purpose what purpose yes to uh, to understand our own historical present to develop a self-understanding right who are we as a country as a culture as a nation state because without a critical understanding of our own tradition we perpetuate constantly the same the repetitions of history, the same dynamic of uh, mythologization of our own heritage, of our mm -hmm. own past, without confronting with courage the very nature of this past as right. something that needs to be constructed, that, that is not given, that needs to be revisited through, through scholarly work. <laughs> there are so many gaps. Absolutely. I mean, now we're operating within a context of a state, right? Mm -hmm. We do have an academy of sciences that more or less tries to regulate or organize or synergize, whatever you want to call it. But in terms of looking at the field of Armenian art historians, Armenian scholars in humanities and in social sciences operating outside of Armenia, do you see any specific difference in terms of how they do? But specifically in the case of history or, for instance, art history, when they're dealing with Armenian issues. Is there a different MO, modus operandi, between Armenians studying uh, Armenian history in the diaspora and within Armenia? I think we are much better placed to answer that question. <laughs> but it's your field, Angela. I think it's your field. Also, you look at art history, right? Uh, granted, you do not exclusively deal with art history mm -hmm. related to Armenia, but uh, obviously when you're, when you're more familiar with the field, you look at other art historians out there is there a tendency to question and redefine historical truths, if you want to call it, or, or do they fall within the, the, in the same trap and narrow themselves, narrow their scope of taking things for granted and building upon that rather than even taking the, the primordialism, I mean, being primordial 
rather than, you know, being uh, completely new. I think, again, the main institutionalized, let's say, uh, art history within post-Soviet Armenia uh, still operates between uh, the poles of, let's say, uh, nationalism and continued reverberations of schematic positivist scholarship, right? Mm -hmm. So again, you have an a priori assumption of uh, national purity, na the, 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 the imperative right. for national preservation, when especially art historians approach historical monuments, and of course the Middle Ages, right, occupies a prominent well, role, because it was culturally so rich and it defines a kind of an Armenian specificity, mm -hmm. uh, historically speaking. And one thing that I would say that, that is lacking uh, in the institutionalized art historical scholarship in Armenia, apart again from the critical understanding that the humanities necessitate, is also complete lack of, let's say, methodological awareness. When you're writing through a specific language, the way you're approaching your object, what are the underlying theoretical and philosophical assumptions mm -hmm. that form your engagement with your object of study? In my four, even six years at the Irvine State University, which was a very rich experience for me, I never had a methods course in art history. Mm -hmm. um, that is one of the biggest challenges, actually, in social sciences as well, methodology, research methodology in social sciences and or humanities. In the last eight years, since 2011 to 2018, Actually, I was involved in uh, organizing summer classes for uh, graduate and postgraduate students, uh, magistratura and aspirant. Uh -huh. They vary a bit, obviously, you know that in the Western uh, classification, about uh, retraining in social sciences and humanities. And it was heavily methodology driven because mm -hmm. that is not offered. Even in Armenian studies here, in Armenian people who claim that they're yes. Armenian studies, they mm -hmm. do not have a methodological training. Mm -hmm. I was trained as a political scientist. I was trained in the methodologies of political science, and I'm not an Armenian mm -hmm. studies person, but I have the tools, and that's the beauty of it, right? When you have those tools, it can be applicable mm -hmm. in a variety of, of subfields, but at the same time in a variety of topics, be that Armenian or otherwise. Right. Yes, also it allows you like a possibility, right, to be self-reflective upon your own approach, your own perspective, your own mode of engagement, uh, that is not a given, but is informed by a particular viewpoint or a worldview, let's say. Whereas, let's say, like in Manchester, right. when I began my PhD studies, uh, and I finally took a methods course, I was auditing a methods course, it was all about deconstructing a tradition that I didn't know and the students didn't uh -huh. know. You start deconstructing uh -huh. a, kind, a kind of an art historical humanistic tradition grounded on uh, Kant, on Hegel, and so on. Through, again, let's say political and ideological motivations, let's say all these scholars are uh, white, colonial, and so on, and male, <laughs> but right. without actually right. engaging well, uh, with them. Absolutely, absolutely. And also, mm -hmm. and it's fascinating to see that in, in post-Soviet space, Marx has been sort of went from hero to zero. Whereas, at least in the Western tradition, Marx is still taught in philosophical or in conceptual frameworks. And, you know, that's a fascinating thing, the consistency. Now, one of the things, this is a fascinating story, but we're running out of time. But I want to ask something that is especially relevant to today's Armenia, not in terms of the post-war Armenia, which is also included there, but... What is the role that humanities or people who are humanist uh, experts in Armenia and social scientists in creating myths about Armenian world in terms of myths that can go anything from uh, as basic as that our army is invincible to the fact mm -hmm. that the diaspora is always going to support Armenia. We have the diaspora to support Armenia instead of oil and so on and so forth. I mean, and there can go on myths after myth after myth. So do you mm -hmm. feel that there is an intentional manufacturing of myth or the reason why we see these myths is because there is no active critical thinkers in humanities and social sciences? I know it's a loaded question, but that's what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll try to be as concise as I can. I think when we talk about myths and mythological thinking, we need to also specify, are we talking about myths that are produced by, let's say, the elites, whether these are political or intellectuals, intellectual mm -hmm. elites, or um, are we talking about myths as sort of mediating link, right, between uh, mm. people's relation with the social world and their imaginary construction of that social world? So but where would that, the, the second one people, come from? 
I mean, wouldn't that, at the end of the day, the intellectuals or the elite be one way or another responsible for both kinds of myths? Uh, no, I don't attribute all kinds of mythological constructions to the intellectual elites. And I think uh, Ashut Hovhannisyan's historical work is especially interesting because he looks at the way in which people's wishes and desires get crystallized, let's say, in um, mythological thinking or in, in the epos. Mm-hmm. And that mythological thinking that is the let's say, the upside-down right image of the people's material struggle, their struggles with everyday life, their struggle, existential struggles with, um, to preserve their identity, beliefs, right. and so on and so forth, they get crystallized as these mythologies of, or ideas of liberation. So they can be people, they, they can be myths, right? And there are a lot of, many kinds of everyday myths, mm-hmm. uh, myths that are produced collectively by regular people. <laughs> and then, uh-huh. of course, you have... Uh, myths that are produced by the intellectual elites, but I think the role of the of critical thinking, the critical role of the humanities is um, that tries to understand its object, the object that it criticizes imminently, right, from inside. Right. Uh, it doesn't stop at dispelling myths, saying, oh, these myths and narratives are just, you know, some fairy tales that are fed uh, to people mm. in order to keep them quiet, right? What is the social basis of the historical constitution of these myths? I want to bring like a very short, uh, f- funny example, which is uh, right? you know, Zizek's perverts, Zizek's perverts Guide of Cinema, right? He, he did uh-huh. this film where he appears in different films yes, actually, and he offers yes. commentary, like Lacanian psychoanalytic commentary, and where in, he appears in Matrix at some point where um, Neo and Morpheus are sitting uh, against each other. And Morpheus is offering two pills to Neo. If you take the blue pill, you go to the world of reality, right. which is traumatic, which is this encounter of the real with the real. If you go, if you take the red pill, you go to the world of illusion. So Zizek appears mm-hmm. and is like, I want the third pill, right? With this fake Eastern <laughs> European accent. <laughs> yes. I don't want uh, the <laughs> distinction between reality and illusion, but what is real in the illusion itself. Mm. Right. Uh, Angela, at the beginning of the conversation, mm-hmm. you did mention something about uh, in the early 20s when you had people, uh, Armenian intellectuals, coming back to Armenia. And you mentioned Ajarian and uh, mm-hmm. several other, uh, Ovanisian as well. But if I'm not mistaken, you know, there are people there, such as, for instance, Nikola Akhbalian and Levon Shan, especially Levon Shan. Am I correct to assume that they belong to the more or less same generation or the same class of, or, or group of people? I, th- I think, yes, they were also part of the 20s, right? The 20s were uh, very right. diverse in terms of their constitution. But I think, uh, as, a part, as opposed to, let's say, Hovhannisyan's legacy or Hostikian that I already mentioned, uh, Akhbalian mm-hmm. and Shant, their legacies were not falsified and distorted to the same extent. Uh, no, well, that was I was going <laughs> yeah. to bring up, because when it comes to that, you know, Hostikian and Hovhannisyan, they stayed in Soviet mm-hmm. Armenia, and they became part of that mm-hmm. through the waves of the Stalin perspective and so on. Whereas Shant and Akhbalian, for instance, they went to the diaspora, and they established a, not a strong tradition because of the lack of a state institution, but they mm-hmm. uh, maintained that, uh, that tradition there. Now, the question is, there were rarely interaction or an osmosis, if you want to call it, between the two wings of this Armenian world, intellectual world, be that humanities, mm-hmm. philology mostly, that was one of the key things. But do you see that there is such a pull and push that exists between Armenia and the diaspora when it comes to these issues of humanities and social sciences? Is it a one-way street, two-way street? Is it a radiation coming out of Armenia or is it more of an osmosis or something completely uh, else, as Zizek would say, right? You know, I want the third option. So what is the, you know, is the what, how would you define it? I mean, if we deal with a really existing situation, right? On the one hand, you have scholarship right. in Armenia that is uh, quite isolated internationally it exists in its own microcosm and on the other hand you have Armenian studies departments in the diaspora that are part and parcel of broader intellectual discourses discussions and so on so the internationalization right of the Armenian studies and scholarship inevitably takes place this is my understanding and I might be wrong Mm -hmm. through the Armenian studies departments in the diaspora, right. because again of the kind of isolated nature of scholarship in, our, in, in, in the Republic of Armenia. This right. has infrastructural reasons, this has uh, again discursive or theoretical or disciplinary reasons and so on. There are many mm-hmm. objective conditions for that, but also subjective. And I think the key would be to establish a kind of a collaboration and relationship wherein the specificity of 
the Armenian scholarship with its, you know, Soviet legacy and with its complex entrenchment, let's say, within the project of Soviet modernity as something that is formative of its own present, is brought to a critical discussion both in the country and in diaspora. Right. And whereas the diasporic engagement with the, with the Armenian studies, with its own uh, specificities mm -hmm. of, let's say, multicultural integration in various environments, etc., can enrich the Armenian scholarship in the country. If there is a dialogue, of course, and that's the question, yes. right? But there's always that, especially mm -hmm. in the 1990s, there was this spat between Armenian historians mm -hmm. in Armenia mm -hmm. and in the, in the diaspora as to unified Armenian mm -hmm. history, uh, lexicon sometimes used, whether or not uh, Moses Khodernazi was in, lived in the 5th century or the 7th century, mm -hmm. or he didn't live at all. I mean, these I would view as very welcome endeavors uh, for discussion. But I just want to get some of your concluding thoughts about this. But I feel that there is more and more disconnect among the scholars, be those in humanities and social sciences in Armenia and in the diaspora, but within Armenia and within the diaspora, mostly based on pre-existing myths or pre-existing concepts that are taken for granted. Whether we like it or mm -hmm. not, it's becoming more and more uh, sort of centralized or less and less diverse. Is that a, at least that's my understanding or my reading of the, the processes now. Would you offer a different reading as to the state of humanities and social sciences in the Armenian world, not just in Armenia? Not having lived there in the last 10 plus years, I know the discourses and conversations, well, relatively superficially, right? I'm, I'm observing, I'm part of the Hovhannisian Institute that we established as a space for young researchers to uh, pursue mm -hmm. scholarship without having to leave the country, country creating conditions uh, for their work <clears throat> and engaging in uh, cultural, historical and philosophical work, analyzing or, or examining what is this phenomenon that we call Armenian modernity, right? How modernity appears from the lens, from the perspective of this small little country <laughs> caught up in this very strange ge geopolitical and <laughs> geographical uh, right. constellation. How does universality appear for this small nation, right? Mm -hmm. um, but on, in general terms, from what I've been following, especially heated discussions that were formed around the recent attempts at educational reforms, the new criteria for history, literature, and, and so on that were proposed by the Ministry of um, Education, Culture, and so on. It's a long na name wherein the main uh -huh. responses that came to that proposal, I don't want to speak about pro the proposal, another time we can talk about it and evaluate, but the main responses that came from the Yerevan State University's uh, History Department, or so the National Academy of Sciences, they lacked any substantial conceptual engagement with yes. its content. Mm -hmm. It was labeled as a threat to national security, because mm -hmm. the concept of patriotism is missing, the emission of 3000 to 1000 BC from Armenian history. <laughs> and of course, the main, the main uh, target was Lilith Magurchan, who was the chair right. of the task force forming the criteria. The yeah, we had a discussion criteria. about the education reform a couple of months ago on this before mm -hmm. the war started uh, and we, we discussed it in detail about some, what are the elements. But that's yeah. also the problem, right? Even those who, those who are criticizing, it is void of any conceptual, as you mentioned, conceptual framework. So it's based on uh, just a light reading or superficial reading uh, of the mm -hmm. material and their understanding of the overall situation. Yes, absolutely. And this is the problem, right? When you do work, where, when you publish something, wherein uh, many, let's say, <laughs> your readers or um, your audiences right. have fundamental problems with, these problems are never critical. You want critical conversation and discussion. You want to engage, right, in a critical mm -hmm. conversation about your work that does justice to your work. But what you receive most of the time is a reaction, is a reaction that is that is constituted through personalistic labels. And unfortunately, mm. this is this is the case. And right. um, it's really, really difficult in Armenia to implement an educational reform because these institutions are very slow moving, almost like swampy, right? Right, uh, right. Structures with their own internal logical operation. Absolutely. It's a quagmire. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges in, uh, especially nowadays, is to try to find new ways of challenging, redefining, mm -hmm. and sometimes even reinventing uh, new approaches, utilizing, you know, the critical thinking and the conceptual framework 
that the rest mm -hmm. of the world, humanities and social sciences use in other parts of the world. Yes. Luckily, we're in a world that it's more interconnected. <laughs> It has its pluses mm -hmm. and minuses. Uh, we might uh, have the impact that we can uh, take whatever we need and uh, improve mm -hmm. what we have, or we can just close our eyes and run away. So I think we can no longer close our eyes. We we see that um, right. <laughs> even if we close our eyes, all That's fictions, it. all the ornamentations that have been covering up <laughs> the reality have been falling right. apart. Yeah. So with that. With keeping our eyes wide open and you know observing all the processes and uh, learning about all of these that is happen as it's happening, but also taking part in it, I think it's it's a fascinating topic. Time as well to try to reset some of these ideas, and I hope we'll have more conversation to revisit these issues. And I would like to thank you, Angela, really for this invigorating discussion, even though we just scratched the surface. So. Thank you for joining us, and uh, I hope we can uh, have you again in the future. Thank you, Aspet, for hosting me on Krung Podcast, and I look forward to continuing our conversation. That concludes this lightning conversation on Grung. We hope it has helped your understanding of some of the issues involved. We look forward to your feedback, including your suggestions for future topics. Contact us on our website at grung.org or on our Facebook page, ANN-Grung, or in our Facebook group, Grung-Armenian News Network. Thank you for listening, and we'll talk to you soon. <laughs>